Hello guys, Winston here. Earlier this week, I hosted my first ever livestream on my second channel where I shared my cam setup to carve a wand from the Harry Potter universe. For those of you who were able to join me, thank you for coming out. For everyone else, I'll summarize the gist of what we went over since the stream ended up going about twice as long as I'd expected. My buddy George is going to Orlando this weekend and wanted some DIY wands to bring to the wizarding world of Harry Potter a la William Osmond, except less crappy. While he toyed around with handmade and 3D printed designs, I set off to one-up him with a CNC machined version. I picked a One Piece STL file of the Elder Wand from Thingiverse and brought it into Fusion 360 to prepare. If you want details about how to set up an STL file in Fusion 360, check out my last video or the livestream. Links will be available in the description below. Because of the time constraints of the livestream, I didn't really get a chance to optimize my cam setup. So on Tuesday, I spent a bit more time off camera fine tuning my cutting parameters. This is what I came up with. My wand project was going to be a two-sided machining job. On the first side, I would start with an adaptive clear using a quarter inch end mill to do the bulk of my material removal, followed by a parallel pass with an eighth inch wall end mill to refine my wand's features. On the top face, I would also bore out some holes for indexing pins so that I could flip my piece over and carve it from the other side. On the back side, I would basically do the same process, adaptive clear most of the material, and finish with a parallel toolpath. One thing to note with my parallel toolpath though was that my ball end mill needs to plunge to at least one radius below the midpoint of the piece so that it can cut the model from the side. So to allow for this, I set my first adaptive toolpath to bottom out 0.06 inches below the midpoint of my model. This would make room for the parallel toolpath to plunge to the required depth. For my parallel toolpath, what I forgot to do during Monday's livestream was to add an avoid touch constraint to my tabs. This would save me about a minute of machining time since the bridges holding my one in place don't need to be finished. For my reverse side adaptive clear, I chose more conservative cutting parameters because my stock would get weaker and weaker as more material was removed. I also didn't need to overshoot the halfway point of my stock since everything on the other side had already been cut away. After posting my g-code, I headed to the garage. This Elder Wand model has a maximum diameter of about 1.1 inches, so I needed stock that was at least that thick. Unfortunately, if you want to buy material from the big box store that'll work for this project right out of the gate, you're basically stuck with 2x4s and pressure treated fence posts. I opted instead to glue up two 1x8 boards to create a 1.5 inch thick slab of pine. Pine is light enough in color that you won't really notice if the grain of the two sides aren't perfectly matched. I could have also used a harder wood like maple which would produce a stronger end product, but I didn't have enough material on hand to do that. My glued up pine board wasn't perfectly flat and ended up having a slight bow in it despite my attempts to clamp it against a piece of wood with an opposite bow while it dried. I used double sided tape to hold my board to my shape oko for two reasons. One, I needed complete access to the top surface of my wood so I could flatten it, and two, using clamps could unbow my wood. If I faced it in that state, the bow in my board could spring back after I released the clamps. You want to flatten your boards in their natural state with as little internal strain as possible. Using a 1 inch surfacing bit that was graciously sent to me by end mills and more, I manually jogged my shape oko over the top face of my board to get it flat. With a level reference surface that I could lay flat against my wasteboard, I could now return to using clamps for work holding. But in order to do so without obstructing access to my top face, I would have to cut a slot in the side of my stock. Using my janky as hell router table, I cut out about a 1 cm deep groove in my stock using a half inch straight router bit in two passes. On the flip side of my stock, I ran a facing operation using 1mm step downs at about 100 inches per minute. In pine, I had a beautiful surface finish. If you were using harder wood though, you'd probably want to take slightly shallower passes. Since there was no double sided tape acting as a standoff between my wood and the wasteboard, I could directly measure the thickness of my stock with calipers. Based on the measured distance, I adjusted my zero point and reran the last pass of my facing operation to bring my stock to within 5 thousandths of 1 and an eighth inches of thickness. Then I loaded up a quarter inch end mill to perform my first adaptive clear. After that, I switched out my quarter inch Makita collet for an eighth inch Olaire collet and loaded up an eighth inch square end mill to bore out the holes for my indexing pins. And finally, I installed my ball end mill for finishing. At this point, the wand was really starting to take shape. After that was done, I bored out a pair of holes in my wasteboard to accept aluminum indexing pins. It's helpful here to use a longer reach end mill since the Makita is marginally shorter than the DeWalt spindle option. These holes ended up being a little too snug so I opened them up a bit more by hand. I flipped my part over and started with adaptive clear number 2. 
This one took about 10 minutes longer because of my more conservative settings. I really had no idea if this would work because I was afraid the tip of my wand would snap off. As it turns out, my adaptive toolpath finished without any drama. Then I ran my parallel toolpath and separated my piece from its frame. You can see here some machining marks from the first pass that was oriented with my wand. This is why I came back with a perpendicular finishing pass. Using a Dremel and some sandpaper, I cleaned up my piece where it had been connected to my stock. Since pine by itself looks pretty bland, I hit this wand with a propane torch and some 400 grit sandpaper to add some contrast and character to the wood. And then, because I was on a deadline, I finished everything off with a bit of mineral oil. This way, there would be no cure time involved, and it would preserve the natural feel of the wood. I ended up being way more fond of this project than I expected. At first, I was just going to make a really simple build montage and throw it up on my second channel, but because of how methodically I had to approach this project and how unique it looks, I decided to put it up here. There's just something amazing about seeing an unnatural form like the Elder Wand take shape in a material like wood. You can't replicate this kind of satisfaction with 3D printing. I hope you guys found this project interesting. I know it's my second STL machining video in a row, but I really found the workflow of this project to be quite enjoyable. Machining in STL isn't always a mindless process of insert mesh, apply toolpath, profit. For fragile pieces like this one, you need to use your intuition to work around the mechanical properties of your stock. It's as much an art as it is a science. Thank you all very much for watching. To see what becomes of this one, keep an eye out on my buddy George's channel, and I'll be back with another CNC-related project video in a week or two.